Do you think there's something quite magical that is within the myths and the songs that there's quite a lot of information within those myths yeah. and things yeah. in terms of where to grow your crops yeah. and how, how to, to do things, where how to, to act things. in the environment? Yeah. Yeah. No, I think it's great. I think that they're very. It's a very beautiful reflection of a culture that um, that was really seamlessly connected with its landscape, and and it's not surprising that um, the health of the landscape and the health of the people went completely hand in hand. Right. And when when the people were cleared off, it wasn't just the people that suffered; it was the landscape, the landscape as well. Landscape. And that's why the shielding system. It wasn't perfect, but it certainly was a very well um, interwoven way of, of having an, uh, 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 an agriculture but also a really rich ecology. The biodiversity was mm -hmm. definitely higher then than it is now in most places in the Highlands. Hi folks, Tom from Van Danby Dothy. So I'm here in the central highlands of Scotland near the village of Bewley at a place called the Shielding Project. Now the Shielding Project is a social enterprise set up with the aim of teaching people the knowledge and skills of our ancestors and bringing it into the 21st century so that we can relearn skills like being more resilient, more sustainable in our way of life and generally just living closer to the landscape. It's also doing some great work in terms of rekindling some Gaelic culture. And I actually worked here for six months last year and it was the, the perfect location for me to start the Highlander series. And uh, I've been back this past week helping out so I thought it'd be a great chance to sit down with the founder of the project, a guy called Sam Harrison, and uh, basically just chat to him about uh, the inspiration behind the project, what sort of stuff people learn here when they come in residentials. So we had a great conversation. We talked about the philosophy behind the project and what Sam is hoping to achieve uh, teaching here. We talked about the past agricultural systems and how that changed the Scottish biodiversity and changed the landscape talked about myths and stories and lots and lots of stuff so hope you enjoy the interview I'll put a link to all the Shielding Project's information in the description below put the website and stuff like that uh, so go check that out and uh, hi hope you enjoy the interview hi folks Tom from Fan Dabby Dozy so today I'm at the Shielding Project and I'm joined by Sam Harrison hi uh, would you say you're the the founder the manager yeah founder uh, founder yeah, of the I project guess, yeah yeah so uh, tell us a wee bit about what's the you know, philosophy behind the Shielding project. Okay, so um, yes, yeah, so the Shielding is really about um, the tradition of the Shielding from the from uh, the Highlands, which is where folk would have taken the cattle up the hill. Mm -hmm. um, so about May time, they'd have gathered all the, all the cows and the other livestock, but it was really about the cows, and they'd have taken them up um, to the Shielding, which was the kind of area where they would be grazing, where there were huts, bothies, um, and they would live up there for two or three months. Um, so it was just a part of the yearly round where um, the cattle would be able to get out of the way of all the crops um, maturing and they'd also be able to take advantage of all that um, grass that was growing out the hills. Yeah. Okay. So that's kind of the, the tradition as it is and then we started the project just to kind of celebrate that with kids and, and yeah. adults and to, to look at all the kind of different aspects of, of what shielding life would have been like from looking after livestock to building buildings to um, learning all the songs and the place names to understanding the plants and the animals that were up in the hills at that point in time. Um, so it has lots and lots of different aspects to it and we wanted to um, use that tradition as a, as a basis for, a, for education really. Okay, cool. So you're using that kind of tradition of the shielding as a baseline story mm -hmm. for an experiential education yeah basically yeah. yeah so kids and adults come here they might be helping us raise our cows they might be um, helping us cook food that we've grown here or, that, or at least it's coming from from the individual yeah. ingredients um, they might they've helped us build almost every single building here um, we always go up if we've got a decent length of time with them we go up to the shielding site that we've got up on the hill where the people mm. used to be and we talk to them about the the stories and how folk used to live. And then we try and look, get them to think about that in terms of the future, so where their food is coming from now, um, how buildings are built now, how the land is used now. So we kind mm -hmm. of use that story from the past to then sort of focus them up to think about what a sustainable future might look like. Yeah, yeah. okay. So um, as a lot of my viewers are uh, really interested in Scottish history, especially Scottish Highlands uh, from a Highlander series. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think, specifically from our Highland ancestors. What do you? What sort of skills and um, culture and things do you think is worth reviving to bring? Okay. To yeah. Yeah. It's a good question. I mean, I think um, for my mind, the the thing about the shielding is that sense of 
um, of that homeness in the landscape. Mm. Um, so they knew where everything was. The, the thing that I try and say to the kids is, look, you know, when we're walking out there and they're, they're a bit uncomfortable or cold or wet or the midges out or whatever, but I try and say to them, look, actually, uh, in the shooting, this is someone's back garden, this is their home, you know, and they felt as comfortable there as we do in our houses. And then you where to get everything, and then you where to find everything. And I think that was the skill that, that the shielding really embodied was just like um, the resilience to be up there. You know, children up there mm. finding their way around, herding the cows, keeping the walls away, rebuilding the hut when they found it knocked down through mm. the winter. You know, all those kinds of um, qualities and capabilities, and and that they really did it all themselves. You know, we, we were very assisted by technology these days, but you know, they were lighting fires from scratch, growing food from scratch, building buildings from local materials, yeah. all pretty much themselves. There weren't any really, there weren't that many specialists out there. Everybody was a generalist. You know? Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, I have always, my Highlander series, because I've tried to um, narrow it down a little bit in the subject, I've always caught, done it in the context of wilderness living skills. Mm -hmm. But then of course in the past, that kind of, the border between wilderness and home yeah. is much more merged. So yeah. you see people living in the shieling that people would have been gathering wild edibles and yeah. lighting fires Absolutely. from friction fires. Yeah, and yeah, and, and, and that whole that that time of year when they're out in the in the the shieling is the time of the year when they're out amongst the boundaries of their of their more sort of cultivated yeah. land. So they're out of the the, the winter home. Um, the fields and they're up into the wilder places, but still they're still thinking about that relationship they have and they probably wouldn't have seen it as wilderness They just saw it as as the wilder bits of their, of their mm. landscape And there's lots of stories from the shielding that, that talk about how to negotiate that relationship and get it right Otherwise the, the forces of the wilderness come out and eat you. Yeah um, So yeah, so it's definitely a, a different kind of feel to the to the landscape and how they treated it and, and obviously the land has changed a lot since then. Yeah, so do you think there's Definitely practical skills, skills in terms of resilience and just you know people realizing where the food comes from. And yeah. Things that yeah. No, I think I think to the practical side of things, it's it's that ability to um, make and mend um, that comes down through that shielding era into crofting as well. Um, you know, the ability for 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 someone like a child to turn a hand to making food or building a building or sawing mm -hmm. something in a straight line or making a basket or. Um, you know, navigating their way through the landscape or creating a song to talk about their experience. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a, it's a lot of that, is, and that links directly to sustainability because people are then being able to make things with their own two hands rather than yeah. relying on plastic or machines or shops to mm. do all. I mean, that's not like they're not going to stop doing that, but not relying on it for yeah. anything. You know? So maybe we should uh, explain a bit better what exactly the shielding project is. So. Can you explain t typically what your typical school group would do? Yeah, so I guess we're a social enterprise. Um, we've got um, 36 beds. We've built this um, education center from scratch over the last mm. four years. Um, and uh, we have all sorts of visitors. We have a nursery, so the little teensy three to five year olds come during Tuesday, Wednesdays and Thursdays. We have school day trips and school residentials. We have summer camps, we have volunteering, we have events. So people come in lots of different ways, sometimes just for the day, but we try and encourage them to stay in our bothies yeah. um, and come for a week. And then when they get here, they're helping us run the croft. So they're helping us with um, looking after the livestock and growing all the food and, um, and, and building the building still, because they're still kind of um, going up. Um, and uh, we do do educational activities, but most of them are as real life as we can get them. Yeah, cool. And so you've got some cows, you've got yeah. pigs. Pigs, sheep, cows, sheep. Chickens, chickens, dogs. And you've yeah. recently started growing your own stuff. Yeah, yeah. Can so, um, is? yeah. So this is um, this is a small oat or a black oat. Okay. So this is the traditional oat that, um, that folk used to, to to grow in the Highlands. Not really grown very much anymore. The modern yeah. oats that we grow um, have a much bigger grain, much bigger seed. Okay. Um, but yeah, so we've been part of a project um, called the Field Lab, which is um, a collaboration between a lot of crofters and growers and the Soil Association and the James Hutton Institute um, and the Gaia Foundation to look at how people could um, return to growing more resilient grain, crops. Because yeah. Cause e even this, because so much of our grain is so monoculture, <laughs> kind of pesticide ridden. Exactly. And, and, and if, if, you, if you took all of that kind of stuff away, that sort of mechanical or oil-based support, they wouldn't do very well. Yeah. So the thing about these crops is that they'll, they're very resilient and they'll, they'll, they'll suffer on in some pretty rough yeah. conditions. Um, and, and part of the project was actually about growing um, a partner, so companion sort of crops. So we grew the oats with some peas and we grew some, um, some uh, thing called U.S. mix, which is a, a, a crofter's mix from U.S., which includes oats and bear barley and uh, rye as well. So it's, it's moving away from the monocrop 
um, and, and looking at how crops can support each other. For example, the peas fixing nitrogen in the ground yeah. to help the other things grow. So, and we, you know, it was our first year, um, and we we definitely got some crop, and we, we've got some lovely long straw as well, which I which I was working with schools just yesterday to turn into. Um, uh, costumes. Oh no, uh, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. you get a different straw, cool. you get the <laughs> grain. Um, we'd like to feed the uh, most of the grain to the animals, so we're mm. producing our own livestock feed. Some of it we'll, we'll eat ourselves, but um, so yeah, so we're just learning really at the yeah. moment about that. And as you find out, it's, it's pretty difficult once, because even with you know a little bit of technology, once you've gone away from your combine harvesters and stuff. Yes, exactly. So we're starting to look back at some of those labor old, intensive. Yeah, um, yeah, the old <laughs> skills of winnowing and um, and threshing and grinding. I mean, this is a modern grindstone, mm. but um, you know the old quern that people would have had, which would have been just about that backable, you know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and the process of getting the grain out from uh, from the stook and um, getting all the, the inedible bits off it. Um, so yeah, so there's a lot of yeah, a lot of learning and a lot of what we're trying to find simple technologies to to manage that yeah that process. So what's the sort of history and the traditions of the different crops that people would have grown in the Highlands? Yeah, so I guess before um, the potato came across from South America, the main two crops that folk would have grown would be this small oats or black oats and the bare barley, which is a sort of um, a, a really good uh, barley, traditional barley. So what, what's the reason for that? Is it just not warm enough for wheat? And not warm enough like for wheat and you've got quite a short growing season, so particularly right. the bare barley, that will that'll sort of... Um, Bring itself out of the soil and get to maturity within 90 days. Okay. So that's really great. Right, that's, right. Yeah, that's the great thing about um, barley is it will come up because obviously you know our springs can be wet and cold and our mm. autumns can be wet and cold. So <laughs> you want something that goes quickly. Yeah. Um, and the oats, the oats are very good at growing in acid soils. So um, it, a lot of our sort of um, highland ground is pretty acidic and yeah, very difficult. Yeah. Very um, little ground. Line. Exactly. So, um, so yeah. So folks. Um, would have lived in a in, in a sort of communal area in the centre of their farm, as it were, and then they would have um, had the inn by around and about that, where they would have had their run rig um, or their lazy beds, and they would have divided those up usually by lot, and so that was the sort of intensive agricultural area, sort of okay. in a circle around the, the, the main village, and um, folk would have put the crops in there. They would have manu manured it from manure that was coming out of the house because the cows would have been in the end of the house through the winter, um, if they would be up by the sea, they'd been bringing some um, seaweed, seaweed on. Yeah. And then they would have had um, something called the outby, which was the sort of less good ground in, in a sort of bigger circle around the village. And that might've been used to hay, it might've been cropped a bit and then left. And then they would have had the dike, the village boundary around the outside of that. And that's the kind of outer area of grazing for the sheeling. So you would sort of either break a hole in the, in the dike or just sort of have a, a gate there. And then that, the cows would go out and up into the hills or the moorland for the for the summer. So that's okay. kind of the stages of um, with the sort of most intensive agriculture happening closest to the house. So that kind of um, moving the cattle away was it was it partly to find a um, new pasture and also to keep the cows away from yeah. their crops. It's, it's a lovely it? double you yeah, know double even. double <laughs> value of that really yeah because you're going to have a nightmare trying to keep your cows away but mm. also you've got this this great bounty up on the hill of the grasses coming through so it's ideal timing and you wouldn't want to be up the hill that much the rest of the year. Yeah years. exactly <laughs> and is it true that the, the wild vegetation of Scotland has changed a lot since? Yeah so the way that, more cattle absolutely so it was a real cattle dominated um, uh, agricultural life and then the way that cows eat and the fact that they, um, they've got the big feet that open up the ground and the way that they poo um, make, make, basically you were looking at a hill um, you know the, the Scottish hills would have been much grassier, lots more forbs, lots more herbs, lots more flowers, mm. lots more grass, a lot less heather. Okay. Um, so because of that sort of intensive movement of all the cows in the, in the highlands basically out in the summer um, munching away, eating everything pooing everywhere, breaking up the soil, yeah. and, then, and then away and resting that land for the, ne for the next nine months, you, you had a completely different ecosystem. It's only when that traditional form of agriculture stopped um, that we get this movement towards a, a, a hill that's covered in heather. Yeah. Um, okay. And bracken, bracken, they used to fight fights over bracken. Yeah, that's so interesting. And that's yeah, everywhere. Yeah, yeah. So, we, so we have to kind of imagine a different, a different It would have looked landscape. quite different. Yeah. yeah, and people up and down, you know, up to the sheiling to the resupply to bring the butter down from the people up there, yeah. carrying yeah. messages, you know, there was a lot Hats of movement. And, yeah, exactly, and a lot more. Yeah, lot more I think that's an, another thing that it's sort of Scotland has this view of being this kind of open wilderness, but of mm. course, not, 
only since the Highland clearances has it been that bare. Yes, it exactly. Yeah, and especially in the summertime, it w really would have been busy. You know, they talk of three or four thousand cattle in in Dromokta in the past right. there uh -huh. um, in Vaidna. So um, you've got some areas where yeah, it's a it's a busy, busy bustling kind of mountainscape. Yeah. Um, and it was wild, but it, it wasn't necessarily deep. You know, there was lots of people and lots of um, story and, and lots of goings on yeah. as the sort of the, the sort of um, Gaelic culture and the stories and the songs, the shieling they they sort of capture all of that. And so, yeah. it, you know, by all accounts, it sounded like it was a lot of fun. You know, people were yeah. excited to get out there into the hill. Um, they were excited to be out and away from the mud and the and the and the, and the, and the winter. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Do you do you think there's something quite magical that is within the myths and the songs that it's it, it's very hard for us to understand in the modern day but to um there's quite a lot of information within those myths yeah. and things yeah. in terms of where to grow your crops yeah. and how, how to, to do things where how to, to act things. in the environment yeah yeah no i think it's great i think that they're very it's a very beautiful reflection of a culture that um that was really seamlessly connected with its landscape and and it's not surprising that um, the health of the landscape and the health of the people went completely hand in hand right. and when when the people were cleared off it wasn't just the people that suffered it was the landscape, the landscape as well landscape. and that's why the shielding system it wasn't perfect but it certainly was a very well um, interwoven way of, of having an, a, 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 an agriculture but also a really rich ecology the biodiversity was mm -hmm. definitely higher then than it is now in most places in the highlands okay. um, so yeah it's really something to think about yeah that's really interesting. So we talked about the black oats. Yeah, and then we've got some rye here, which rye. has an even longer um, straw. And um, so a rye, rye is a type of wheat. So this is this is one I'm particularly interested in because um, it's got a decent gluten content. Okay. And so um, you know it's it's actually quite good for bread um, and sourdough. So so rye, I don't I don't know enough, but I think it was certainly in more recent times it's certainly been part of the U.S. Um, crofters mix. Um, alongside the oats and the barley, um, and I haven't got any examples of the barley here to, mm. to show you, but um, but they're very distinctive and, and um, they look quite different in, in the way that they grow. Um, and then if you're growing them all together, of course, then you've got to work out how you're going to separate the grains yeah. once you've threshed them. So we're looking at different sort of combinations. So people would have mixed them. Yeah. yeah, I think so. I think that the, the idea of the mix is both that um, you know you can. You, you know, you've got a diverse field, but also if you have a year where it's just good for the oats, you're you, you know, and bad for the rye. You haven't just planted rye; no, you've planted yeah. a mix, and yeah, one, yeah. you know, so you've got that flexibility and resilience, hopefully, yeah. um, to to what your, what your environmental conditions are doing. But we're looking um, to save some of our seed and start replanting it and start getting a seed stock that's going to be quite well attuned to this bit of ground, because yeah. at the moment there's very few people who grow these grains mostly in the Western Isles or in um, up in Shetland and Orkney. And so those grains have kind of adapted to those mm -hmm. places. So that's another thing in terms of learning from our ancestors about resilience is that now, uh, nowadays no one uh, saves seeds. Yeah. So how do you do that? How, how do you preserve them, how keep you do them, them dry? So it's funny how we've, we've come so far in many ways in terms of technology, but we're forgetting so much of that foundation skills that you know, if something bad does happen, um, then just like, yeah, fundamental things about saving our seeds, like yep. most of yep. that being able to gone. grow stuff. Yeah, and, and, this, and, and the great thing about, you know, the ways that people have done it in the past is they're very low carbon, you know, they can mm -hmm. be quite intensive on effort, but, they, but they're not actually that expensive to do in mm -hmm. terms of, of cost or oil. Um, so it's, it's better the, for the soil as well. Yeah, exactly, yeah. So these are the kinds of things we're really excited about learning and passing on to folk. Um, and, and yeah, and, and getting a getting a crop that that, that really um, works well in this um, in this environment. So we'll probably save the seed from the, the most successful plants, mm -hmm. and then and then over two or three years of process, then we'll have something that's um, that's quite well provenance from from our soils and our, yeah. our weather. Yeah, specific. Cool. Well, I'm sure we could talk for like hours. But yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Maybe we can. Uh, We'll have to come back next year. Yeah, I'll have to come back. Yeah, yeah. And we'll show you the crops when they're when they're all yeah, growing. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's uh, how, how long has the project been going now? Five years. Five yeah. years. Yeah. So it's really amazing just how quickly it changes and how yeah. fast all the buildings yeah, are going. Yeah, yeah. No, we've so got we've got a lot of a lot of people behind us, and the kids are all helping um, build and grow. So yeah, it's just yeah. a lovely thing. Cool. Well, yeah, I look forward to seeing where the project yeah. goes. Thank and, you very uh, much. Thanks for thanks for having the interview. Welcome. And uh, I'll put a link to um, the Sheelan Project's website in the description below. 
you should check it out. So there is um, school residentials, but you also have a craft week. Yeah, craft yeah, week and summer camps camp. for families, yeah, yeah. and kids, yeah. Um, and yeah. we also have events as well, especially we're having quite a few events um, over the next little while about the grains. So, so yeah. the grains, yeah. yeah. Cool. Um, cool, yeah, so I'll put all the uh, information in the description below. You should go check that out. Thanks so much for watching, and um, I'll see you in the video soon. Thanks, Thanks Sam. Cheers. <laughs>